All right, everyone, so for this one, this lecture, I'm going to start talking about poetry, and you'll notice that I'm going to jump around quite a lot uh, in this lecture in your readings and bring in a lot of outside information. Uh, poetry is one of my areas of expertise and one of my primary areas of interest, so I'm fairly passionate about this. I am a published poet. I have two degrees in it, so it is something I, I deem very important. However, I do realize that for a lot of students, poetry is actually something that is uh, basically on the same level as having teeth pulled. So what I'm going to try to do in this lecture is, is tear down some of those misconceptions of poetry that you might have learned uh, in previous classes. Uh, you know, poetry is a really, really exciting use of language, and it's the oldest form of literature, and there's a reason for its staying power. So we need to think about that when we're thinking about what poetry is and what it means to us. So I'm going to show you a lot of different poems. I'm going to refer a lot to your textbook the 13th edition of literature. Uh, there are citations galore in this uh, slideshow as well. I'm also going to post just the slideshow without the video, but uh, you know, you're going to need to use writing matters to refer to specific ways of citing poetry because poetry requires different citations than uh, traditional fiction or nonfiction. Uh, and for example, in text for a poem we would cite the line numbers instead of the page numbers and that sort of thing. So uh, be sure that you're looking at that as we go. Uh, I'll be referring to these things. Now a lot of the texts are also uh, posted here on the slideshow as well. So uh, you can use that, but I, I would prefer that you read them in the textbook and maybe pause the video from time to time uh, and, and really contemplate these texts because poetry can't be read like fiction or uh, nonfiction. Uh, it needs to be read slowly and thought about, uh, read out loud, listen to recordings, uh, that sort of thing, because poetry is all about language. So uh, some suggestions, be sure that you complete the assigned quizzes, that you read the textbook material that I assign, uh, and be uh, focused on those discussion boards. That's where this lecture is going to pop up to begin with, so your discussion will be in relationship to this lecture, but I will be checking those discussions to make sure that you've actually paid attention to the lecture. Uh, I have some goals with this lesson. Uh, that should say 13th edition uh, instead of 12th edition, uh, but you want to make sure that uh, we're hopefully meeting these goals. So let's start with this quote here. Poetry is a literary genre or type of literature. So when you're thinking about poetry, for example, as opposed to fiction or drama, uh, poetry represents a certain segment of literature. And if you recall in our previous unit, we defined literature in a number of different ways, and all of you defined it differently in your papers. But there were some qualities that a lot of people agreed upon, things like uh, Ezra Pound's quote that literature needs to be news that stays news, that needs to be relevant, uh, that it's language charged with meaning, which is what poetry is all about, uh, those sort of concepts. So. One of my favorite critics and writers is this guy, Louis Turco. I know I already referred to him in one of the lecture videos. This is a fantastic book if you're interested in poetry, uh, a good way to get started thinking about it. Uh, but he calls poetry the art of language, and he differentiates it from fiction, which he calls the art of written narrative. Now, what does it mean to be the art of language? Well, if you think about a poet uh, like a painter, Painters use brushes, different kinds of brushes, different types of canvases and materials, different types of paints, acrylic, oil, watercolors. Uh, they use all these different textures and these different materials and tools to create uh, artistic effect. Well, poets, uh, their tools, their materials, their, their paints, are language, their syllables, their accents, 
their images that are tied to words, their the field of the page, they're the shape of the letters, uh, all these things that I'll be talking about in this lecture. Uh, so the difference then here is that poetry is really focused on the language itself, uh, the linguistic units, whereas fiction is more focused on telling a story or showing a story to you, evoking that uh, book movie, as Jack Kerouac would say. So we're going to look at a few poems, three in particular, as it talks about here, Grasshopper, Much Madness is Divinest Sense, and Traveling Through the Dark, to see how poets use language in different ways. And indeed, we'll be looking at a lot of different poems in this lecture and the second poetry lecture, uh, and, and music too, to see how language is the most important aspect of poetry. And really, the poet's focused on language is what separates him or her from other uh, creative writers. So this is the poem here, Grasshopper, and I know I talked about it in the previous lectures and what is literature. So you already know that it says Grasshopper, who as we look up now gathering into the leap, arriving rearrangingly to become a Grasshopper, you already know that it actually says that, and it's the syntax, the word order, the shape, the uh, letter order that E.E. E. Cummings, that's the poet, is playing with here to create meaning. So he's using the field of the page. That's the white space over here where you see the arrow uh, of my cursor kind of going around in circle. That's all the white space between these letters. He's using that. He's using the punctuation. He's using capitalization and uh, letter order to create meaning. And he's showing that uh, the grasshopper doesn't become the grasshopper until it actually leaps. So this is an attempt uh, for the language to actually mimic, this is important, to mimic what the object in the real world is doing. So this is taking something that's slippery, language, that uh, has multiple meanings. You know, I may call this a grasshopper. Somebody else may call this a grasshopper. Somebody may call this a grasshopper. None of these things are grasshoppers, though. Right? We all agree that it's the insect, but why did we come to some sort of agreement that this one word uh, should be applied to this one insect? And you know, some people confuse grasshoppers with cicadas. Some people think they're the same thing. Those are two entirely different words for the same concept. So what makes a grasshopper a grasshopper? It's not the name. It's the action of the grasshopper leaping. And that's what this poem is getting at. We call this concrete poetry or conceptual poetry. Here's another one, Dickinson. You can see the poem over here. I believe that's the most up-to-date page number in your textbook, but some of these page numbers may be off. So always refer to your table of contents because I've used uh, a variation of this slideshow now for two different editions of literature. Uh, so one of the things Dickinson said about poetry is, if I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. So the way Dickinson knew a poem was a poem is if it made her suddenly have a moment of realization. And one of the things that we do linguistically are with language as poets to manipulate uh, readers into having that sort of realization is we work with lineation. Uh, lineation is the use of line breaks to create meaning. Let me go back here to create meaning. So you can see here that Dickinson's poem is organized not based on sentence structure, not based on traditional grammar. In fact, words are capitalized seemingly without reason. Right? Much madness is divinest sense. Uh, so we have madness and much and sense uh, capitalized here to a discerning I. Notice I is capitalized. Much sense. Sense is again capitalized. The starkest madness. Madness is capitalized. Tis the majority. And this is all prevail. Assent, and you are saying, demure, you're straightway dangerous. 
and handled with a chain. And chain is capitalized here. So what's with the capitalization? Well, that draws your eye when you're reading. What's with breaking the lines instead of syntactically with these dashes? She's using a thing called M dashes, these long dashes. So why do that? Well, it carries the thought over to the next one. So your eye, as you're reading, starts to move across the page. And it causes you to emphasize different things. And if you look, since I, madness, majority, prevail, sane, dangerous, chain, all those words jump out at you, even without the capitalizations, to reinforce the meaning of the poem and cause you to have that effect of the top of your head being taken off, like Dickinson talks about. And this may be a little wild for many of you right now, where you are in your relationship with poetry, and I'm going to speak of it as a relationship. You may not quite understand this concept yet. It's something that takes some time. So uh, I'm really just introducing the idea of lineation to you. Now, this is a poem that probably looks a little more like the poetry that you've experienced, but it has all those other elements. It has lineation. He's playing with field of the page, uh, and he's also working with meter. There's meter in this poem. I'm not going to scan it yet. That's the next lesson that will scan poetry. But I do want to read it to you so you can hear the sounds that William Stafford is using. And this poem actually appears in your textbook. I don't have the page number here or in the Works Cited page at the end of the slideshow. But you can, again, check the table of contents. So here's the poem. Traveling through the dark, I found a deer dead on the edge of the Wilson River Road. It is usually best to roll them into the canyon. That road is narrow. To swerve might make more dead. By glow of the taillight, I stumbled back of the car and stood by the heap a doe, a recent killing. She had stiffened already, almost cold. I dragged her off. She was large in the belly. My fingers touching her side brought me the reason. Her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still, never to be born. Beside that mountain road, I hesitated. The car aimed ahead, its lowered parking lights. Under the hood purred the steady engine. I stood in the glare of the warm exhaust turning red. Around our group, I could hear the wilderness listen. I thought hard for all, for us all, my only swerving, then pushed her over the edge into the river. It's a pretty powerful poem, and if you listen, you can hear the different language, uh, the rhythm, the repeated D's and P's and B's, and where words are emphasized, the L's that are softening. There's lots of things that Stafford's doing here. But on the surface, it looks pretty straightforward. It doesn't even look like it's got any form to it. And that's one of the things we'll talk about is this idea of form, uh, closed form, open form, free verse, all that rubbish, because really all language has form in order for it to have meaning. So getting to that, Zukovsky, another great poet, that's a picture of him right there. He says that prose chopped into verses of alternately rhyming lines of an equal number of syllables is not poetry. So another thing to remember is that poetry doesn't have to rhyme, that rhyme is not the most important part of poetry. In fact, as you saw in Stafford's poem, there are rhymes, but those rhymes don't necessarily appear at the end of a line. Uh, rhyme is only one aspect of poetry. You know, you see that in Dickinson. Nothing here rhymes, really. You see that in uh, Cummings' poem, Grasshopper. You know, these poems uh, all work outside of rhyme, so that's not the main element of what makes a poem. So, one of the things to think about then is how does the language then create a poem? How does the language of poetry differ uh, from the language of prose. So if you look at, say, Langston Hughes, you have uh, some of his text in the assigned readings in your textbook, right? If you look at the uh, critical case studies, um, you might think about how Langston Hughes uses sound to create 
uh, some really, really powerful language here. Um, you know, probably one of the most famous ones is on page 969, and that's a theme for English B, which is uh, really apropos considering uh, you are in an English class. So let's look at that, page 969. Uh, theme for English B. Uh, now there's rhyme in this poem, but it's not traditional rhyme as you're thinking, uh, and there's lineation. So let's read it. The instructor said, go home and write a page tonight and let that page come out of you, then it will be true. Notice the rhyme there, that's what we call a uh, couplet, those two lines actually, four lines there, uh, act as a couplet there, italicized. And then we get into this. I wonder if it's that simple. I am 22, colored, born in Winston-Salem. I went to school there, then Durham, then here to this college on the hill above Harlem. Notice the rhyme between Salem and Harlem. I'm the only colored student in my class. The steps from the hill lead down into Harlem through a park, then I cross St. Nicholas. 8th Avenue, 7th, and I come to the Y, the Harlem Branch Y, where I take the elevator up to my room, sit down, and write this page. It's not easy to know what is true for you or me at 22, my age. Notice the rhyme, but age comes in the middle of that line rather than the end of the line, as you would expect. But I guess I'm what I feel and see and hear. Harlem, I hear you. Hear you, hear me, we too, you, me, talk on this page. I hear New York too. Me, who? Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present. Our records, Bessie, Bob, or Bach. I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white, but it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me as I am a part of you. That's American. Sometimes, perhaps, you don't want to be part of me, nor do I often want to be part of you. But we are, that's true. As I learn from you, I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white and somewhat more free. This is my page for English B. Interesting, right? How he's using rhyme there. So, there are only two modes in which any genre can be written, prose and verse, and this is true of poetry as well. You can have prose poetry and verse poetry, and people often use the term verse interchangeably with the term poetry, but verse actually refers to metered language, as it says here, metered language, and that's very important to understand that some language has meter to it, that it's emphasized with syllables and accents, and that's something we'll really focus on in that next lecture, and some language doesn't, some poetry doesn't. So let's look at these three poems. Hopefully my links still work here. Let me test and make sure the video comes up. I'm sorry for the, like, trail into infinity. Okay. So it does not look like that link is going to work. We'll try one more time. We're getting the spinny wheel and then nothing. Ah, uh, good old Internet Explorer. So here's what we're going to do, as with all things. Uh, you can go to here. can select videos. I'm going to see if I can find Ruthkey reading. That's what the video had said. Here we go. I want you to just listen to this. Are you a woman? I'm a woman. Long man ago, when small birds sighed, she would sigh back at them. How much room she moved more ways than one, the shapes a bright container can contain. Of her choice virtues only God should speak, or English poets who grew up on Greek. 
I'd have them sing in chorus, cheek to cheek. How her ambitions went, she stroked my chin. She taught me turn and counter turn and stand. She taught me touch that underlined white skin. I nibbled meekly from her proffered hand. She was a sickle, I poor I the rake, coming behind her for her pretty sake. But what prodigious mowing we did make. Love likes a gander and adores a goose. Her full lips pursed, the errand doth to seize. She played it quick, she played it light and loose. My eyes, they dazzled at her flowing knees. Her several parts could keep a pure repose, or one hip quiver with a mobile nose. She moved in circles, and those circles moved. Let's see the grass, and grass turn to hay. I'm martyr to emotion, not my own. What's freedom for? To no eternity. I swear she casts a shadow like this stone. But who would count eternity in days? These old bones live to learn her wanton ways. I measure time by how body sways. And that's the actual poet reading that poem, Theodore Rutke, one of my favorites. Uh, I love that last line, I measure time by how a body sways. And that measurement of time is actually very much a part of that poem. Let's see if we can get Saul Williams set the shotgun to the head to pull up. And again, we're not going to get that to pull up. So we're going to go and look it up. Saul Williams is another favorite poet of mine. Uh, he is a poet who uh, came to fame through uh, the documentary uh, Slam Nation and he started really back in the uh, 1990s that's where he really blew up um, let's see if I can find Barnaby Munison the last night they okay let's see if this was some passageways I will find my way to this will probably be. Times for his name that she would not be known even unto herself. Barnaby Munison, the last night they drank from different cups. Children. Yeah, the, the audio on this one's version. Now, this version's better. Now, this is a long. Children of the night. Let's rewind a little bit because I want to give you some background. This is a very long piece. So, this does not appear in your textbook, but you can type it up and look it up. This is a combination of two pieces of his. He often reworks his pieces in performance. You can get a whole copy of this. Uh, in fact, uh, I have the text. I might have loaned it out. Nope, here it is. And you can see that it's not just uh, audio as he does here. But he also does a lot with visual, with the printed version of the text, uh, different sh font shapes, different lineation. It's really, really fascinating. And this video isn't the whole text, but it's a good portion of it. So, um, in fact, so it's easier for you to focus. I am going to minimize my video here. So you can focus on Saul reading for the next 10 minutes. Children of the night, mirrors of the day taught scorched and burned, burned not, the dam is broken, the curse is fled. Once muddy and still, the river runs red. All those ships that never sailed, the ones with their sea cocks open, that light scuttled in their stalls. Today, I bring them back, huge and transitory, and let them sail forever, forever, the recurrent sun current, but when it could not serve a truth currency. Current will be unlocked and sun sparked, unlocked bills, will I am certain I speak a new language, as is always the first sign of a new age. I have begun to believe my black materials were on path to decay. When they truly they had begun the gradual process of crystallization. I am who walks in one swing feet with toenails of abacus and rose quartz. My path now crystal clear. I am coming to tell you she is here. It is not written. No pen 
man ship was ever coupled with her character. Note, books are carefully folded far as void of autumn down from the sun. Likewise, made lessons on the outskirts of history. On the dark side of the moon, where the searchlight of the sun cannot spot her, nor rot her, the seed of forbidden fruit. Every tree has a hidden root, yet she has come to light the strumming patchwork of vibrant dreams in the big of the girl I was tempted to break up with because she slept too much. <laughs> I now know. They heard you with them. They slept in past gems and cycles, worst in ships, and became on rotation. Unnamed every time she was known that she would not be known even to herself. Undressed every time she was dressed that she would not be recognized any other than herself. They mindful of her in stuttering circles that she would find a way to hear the news and her intuition. And she has come. I'm the same disoriented man in her presence. I wear my lonely cloth over my eyes and ejaculate too soon to get my bottle five sin. <laughs> I pay to you and cut the wind and in doing so guard the entry into a century, one hundred years of solitude. I will now pay with my hands outstretched with these songs etched into my palms. Most of it, I'm certain of nothing more than your existence. A thousand hands come under a log and find themselves exposed to my childlike search for you. My colleague, Flower, I'm eternally destroyed, they love me alone, my eligible friend work is pension. My friends laugh at me and talk behind my back, they say that you've changed me, and I am. I'm like survivor of the flood, walking through the streets, fringed with God, surprised all the drowned victims are still walking and talking. No need is hope. I rush to each victim's side, sucking what I can to be out of your various incarnations, pumping your stomachs and filling them. To touch them is to touch you, to kiss them is to kiss you. My friends, love is an art form, slightly removed from its element. Now, when they ask, what does this mean? I respond, I've made it up, and it shall be from now on. From now on, Cities will be built on one side of the street so that soothsayers will have wilderness to wander and lovers face enough to contemplate a kiss. She kisses if she alone would forge a signature of the sun. I close my eyes, although I never knew the difference. I stood before a brighter light, at lesser distance, and then a feeling. What was it that they were bound to be repeated ever again as if history had been as massively created as the great pyramids and the reconstruct or relive any given moment without the sample understanding of how the pyramids are built from the top down? And if one could understand such mastery, one would also understand that pyramids were first made of flesh and that kisses are portals of a sacred breath shifting through hidden corrals and passageways. I will find my way to eternity. Within me, when I can feel the bleeding in the eye like a stone gargoyle atop some crumbling building, springing to life a resuscitated angel, I sweep through city streets, my wings outstretched, making mothers clutch their young and remember. And do you remember, dear mother, had your history forsaken you? Your mysteries, cold and song, chant some round fires, all incantations calling forth this day. On this day, Drunks, vomit in unison. For last night, they drank from different cups. Children have been playing, introducing their parents and visible friends. A country girl smiles, and two trees blossom out of season. Sea suns awaken. Our mother had returned away from us from uncertainty. Once title, twice born of wooden ships, thrice born to mother's hips, mother ships, face two lips, a poet's garden. Two from five, the going fast, the future's broad, and that's changed. I heard the name, the river's parting. Hurry up and hurry up, the sun is darkened. Rivers like oceans, oceans like answers, questions in cloud forms. Raindrops and stanzas to be or not to, to see or not to. She had eyes like two turntables, mixed her in between. My dreams and reality blend in ancient wounds. The basis of Isis, cross faded to unk. The beat drops like a cliff, overlooking my heart. 6,000 feet above sea level. 3,300 bodies disassembled. The head bones connected to the Cockpit, we jerk ass backwards, dancing with slaves in the mosh pit. Punk rock of Gibraltar, roll out, nothing's new. No blood dies in Mohawk, only this time it's you. And you never loved her for what she possessed. You powdered her face and came on her headdress. Oil slick feathers, we just sent for the bed. Mother Nature's a whore, said the shotgun to the head. And it smelled like teen spirit. Angst driven, insecure. The country in Cuban, 
of country and more. The greatest Americans have not been born yet. They are waiting patiently for the past to die. Please get blood. Those tumbling tablets want to share a story with the burning bush. Where is that voice from nowhere to remind us that the holy ground we walk on, purified by native blood, has rooted trees whose fallen leaves now color for the sacred list of the man's? Who among us can give translation of autumn dunes to morning dunes? The name command was overboard has simply rooted us in history's repeating cycle, a nation in its saddened years that won't acknowledge karma. Where is that voice from nowhere? The ones who the prophets spoke of, find your voices of fear, disconnected from the diaphragm, dangling from coffee cup of teeth that spill into our laps and scorch our privates, your voices from the sides of necks, some already loose, dangling particles, pronouns running for sentence, serving life in corner offices and ghetto quarters, your voices are the same, dead to themselves, numb to the possibility of truth existing beyond that which they can palm in their hands, period. There are voices of elders, which seem to do no more than damage to our childish ways, for in many households, wisdom no longer comes with age. So, where is that voice from nowhere, that burning bush, that passing dove? Why hear the voices of generals calling for ammunition, presidents calling for arms, and women calling for help? Where is that voice from nowhere, that God of Abraham? Can he be heard over the gunfire, the whiz of crashing missiles, the passive crash of buildings, the crack of bones? the cries of children, or is that his mighty voice? Your angry God created the sacrifice of first generation sons to generate your holy books written and written on burning sands. Your prayers between rounds are no more than fast in the fate of your children to the hammered truth of your trigger, a truth that mushrooms its dark and hot of the rest of us that we too bear witness to the short-lived fate of a civilization that worships a male God. Your weapons are phallic, all of them. That dummy that sits in the lap is no longer a worthwhile spectacle. His shrunken pillow face is in a room for imagination. We have spotted the movie lips that pin the voice to its proper source. It is a source of madness, a source of hunger for power, a source of weakness, a source of evil. We are exiting your Coliseum and encircling your box office, demanding our families back, our culture back, our language back, our gods back. So we may return them to the proper source, the source of life. The source of creation of a mother's womb, the great goddess. We will cut through the barb iron hangers and chastity belts. We will climb in and incubate our spirits through the winter. We will wait through the degenerate course of your repeated history. We will wait for the past to die. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that is Saul Williams said the shotgun to the head and bloodletting live. Uh, as I said, you have, uh, if you like that piece, uh, this is what the book itself looks like. Uh, if you want to ever order it, it's really quite beautiful how it's laid out. And it really emphasizes what I'm talking about with uh, lineation and text and the visual attributes of poetry as well as the auditory attributes of poetry. It's, it's really, really an impressive piece. Uh, we're going to actually skip over the Julie Kane piece that is uh, listed on here uh, because of time. I don't want to make this too long, uh, but you can of course do a search uh, for Julie Kane's used book. She was the po poet laureate of Louisiana for some time, about two years back, uh, and, and a, a good friend. So it seems that we can define poetry as writing that is concerned with sound, but isn't language more than just sound? So we have some problems. You know, we've talked about here the idea of sound. We've uh, listened to a lot uh, having to do with sound. Uh, so like Samuel, t people do not listen to poetry as often as they read poetry in our century. In fact, most of what you're doing is reading this textbook, right? You're not actually listening to recordings of these poems. Uh, one of the most famous poets, the romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, defined poetry as the best words in the best order. So uh, for him, it's not so much the sound of the words, but the syntax. Now, syntax does affect sound, 
I mean, if we switch the order of words, it changes the way they sound, obviously. If syllables are moved around, it changes the sound. But what he's talking about when he's talking about syntax is the order of the words on the page. Uh, another thing that's a challenge is sound changes over time. You saw the way uh, Saul Williams pronounced words is different than the way I pronounce words. It's different than the way uh, Theodore Rutke was pronouncing words different than the way you pronounce words, and we know different subsets of different cultures have different uh, pidgin versions of English uh, throughout the United States. The way we say words here in Southeast Texas is very different than the way someone might say words in uh, Minnesota. I had a friend there who used to pronounce root rut, you know, so uh, I mean it changes. And then we have this notion of emotion, which is central to poetry and most people's understanding of poetry. Uh, that, that, you know, poetry should create some sort of transcendent feeling, uh, bring us closer to the profound or the sublime. Things like what Wallace Stevens says, a revelation in words by means of words, so that a poem should evoke this sort of uh, almost spiritual experience. And so what does emotion have to do with it? So let's deal with syntax for a little bit. You know, syntax, again, refers to the field of the page, and we saw... Uh, Emily Dickinson doing that. You can see that with Saul Williams's book. You know, I keep showing you pages and, and the little video thing there that's showing me the lecture, or showing you all the lecture of me talking. But you can see the different the different images, right? And the shape of the words. This is not how you format an essay, obviously. Uh, e. e. Cummings did it with Grasshopper. You'll see that with his poem in Just that we'll read shortly. We call this with playing with the field of the page. And the field of the page is literally if I open up a Word document uh, and I open up a blank document, this is literally the field of the page. And I can do all kinds of things with the field of the page when I'm writing a poem. Poem experiment for class number one you know and please don't take this as how writing a poem should be because poetry should take time uh, it should be done with thought but I'm gonna just pick random lines from the textbook uh, and move them around the page and you know go from there so let's say what's going on here Why are we stopping? Old woman across the way. She has to bear. Art of losing. I find it curious kind of cheating here because I don't like the lines that are coming up in the textbook. Um, but actually we'll do that. So here we have different word order, we have different shapes, the lines are all over, we're playing with the field of the page. And I've talked about this before, you know, this is concrete and uh, concrete and conceptual poetry. And I have some things link linked in the slideshow. Uh, let's see if it pops up. It says it's not responding, so it might not actually pop up for you. Uh, let me make sure that you can see this link here. I'll shrink my video, uh, make it a bit smaller and move it over here. Hopefully that doesn't cause 
any dizziness. <laughs> so, okay. Um, well, it's not going to lo load the link for my computer because I have too many windows open and the video is probably blocking it. But you can see, I'm going to not save this either, uh, that you can see that idea. All right. And of course, this is decided to lock up. If you ever are on a PC and your computer decides to lock, you can go to Task Manager, which you probably just saw the screen go blank. I'm going to end the task and restart it. See, even our work computers have trouble from time to time. Okay. It's restarting. Close down Spotify while I'm at it too. Maybe that'll help. And that. There we go. And we will close that. Go to the page we were on. We're on this page with Coleridge. And go back here for you all. Okay, so you can try that link. Hopefully it won't lock up your computer. So there's the grand history in poetry of these different poetic schools that play with the field of the page, pay, play with the order of language. I already showed you Pizza Kitty in a previous, uh, in a previous lecture. I don't really want to show you it again. I, Poems kind of painful if you ask me, but things like Flarf and Dada, prose poems, anti poetry, concrete poetry, uh, all of these things, and even regular poetry, uh, experiment with syntax. So, like you see here, this is a conceptual poem, and what they've done is instead of using punctuation, let's go back, instead of using punctuation, they've actually typed out the word. So instead of having the symbol comma, they have the word comma. Uh, instead of having that, you know, they, and then there's a definition here on conceptual poetry. And y'all can look on, at that on your own time. Ubu Web's really fun. And here's more links to information about Flarf if you find that interesting. Uh, but what I wanted to get to is this poem by Dylan Thomas, one of my favorite poets, and my craft or soul and art. And so you can see... Uh, what, how he's playing with syntax and how the words here create sounds. In my craft or soul and art exercised in the still of night when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms I labor by singing light not for ambition or bread or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on the spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. And you notice here that there's very little punctuation. There's some commas that slow us down. There's line breaks that come, slow us down. But really, each stanza is a total sentence. And that some of the words are in interesting orders because of the way things have been broken. So one of the things he talks about here is uh, not to think too much about a poem until it's been typed. Because once it's been typed, you can really see how the words fit together. Uh, so one of the things I want you to think about is this graph here. Poetry is the art of language that deals with sound and syntax. But we haven't really touched on emotion yet. But what about emotion? Isn't poetry supposed to also make us feel something? And when I often bring up this definition of poetry, I'm a formalist. That's my critical school when I'm thinking about poetry. I actually consider myself a neo-formalist. You'll see one of my poems at the end of this slideshow uh, and at the end of the next slideshow. I think form is a way of thinking about poetry. I really emphasize the language, but other critics, other readers, and you yourself might emphasize this idea of the emotion. To me, the emotion and the language and the syntax and all those things, sound and syntax, are inseparable. Uh, you really can't uh, feel the wonder or experience the wonder unless the language evokes it. 
And so that's why it's so important to understand language with poetry. And that's why poetry actually is really difficult sometimes, particularly for, for younger students, because they don't want to take the time to understand how the language is working. They want that immediate gratification that comes from reading it. And they don't want to contemplate the, uh, you know, they don't want to contemplate the, what went into the magic, for example. It's sort of like going to a magic show and knowing all the tricks of the magician before the magic show. It takes the wonder out of it. It takes the mystery out of it. Uh, part of your job this semester uh, and in this class is to learn the tricks to the magic show that is poetry. So, language is made up of syntax and sound, space and symbol. We are affected by all of these things. Language has music. Again, Louis Zakowski states, good verse is determined by the core of the matter, which is, after all, the poet's awareness of the differences, changes, and possibilities of existence. But that experience is actually evoked through understanding language. Like, language is meant to be almost like an incantation, uh, if you think about it, to conjure up the core of the matter. And so transcendence, and this gets into kind of metaphysical stuff that people with more scientific minds really don't want to deal with, but we're going to deal with it because we're poets and we're dealing with an art. Uh, and we're a bit, we have to be a bit romantic here to actually address poetry. The, the, the magic of the poem, the core of the matter, the changes and possibilities of existence are all manipulated by language. Language conjures up into existence these different meanings. So there's this great uh, little thing that Saul Williams, who we just saw read, did on uh, the list about who he thinks are some of the best poets. And I want to look that up for you. So you can see his list and see some of the reasons he likes poetry. Poets, poetry sometimes is like wine, you know, it ages, it can age really well. If it ages really well, it's called scripture. Leonard Cohen, uh, his, his poetry is beautiful and rich and even right now especially right now his writing is so rich orgy lord's first book of poetry was called black unicorn uh, woman feminist lesbian uh black but beyond and within all of that, just a beautiful sense of awareness in her writing. I started writing because I had a need inside of me to create something that was not there. My favorite beat poet is Bob Kaufman, um, who said stuff like, I had to put my eyes in a diet because my tears were gaining too much weight. <laughs> beautiful. I like them because of their, they're from the Middle East and, uh, and they come from a long tradition of poetry and the amount of irreverence that they have for, uh, for everything from how thankful they are with the idea of God, religion, and all of these things. To me, it's, it's brilliant and super old, hundreds of years old. Really, who could forget poetry of, uh, of Justin Bieber? To me, that's, that's really profound. It's even more profound if you're a baby. I've tried regressing into being a child so I can hear it, and uh, it's very rich. Very rich. So, other than uh, the gag about Justin Bieber at the end there, uh, and sort of the, the mockery in that, which you might not have liked, um, he has some good observations, and the reason I play that video for you is the things he points to that are important to him in poetry, uh, the emotional side of it, the profundity of it, the richness of it, the texture of it, 
and, and just the power of the words, which for most poets, the words themselves, the language itself is inseparable from that profundity. Uh, and you notice that in how he commented on it. So an example of that is this uh, Ars Poetica by Archibald uh, MacLeish. I've heard it pronounced a couple ways. Let's move the video down here so you can see the full text. Ars Poetica. A poem should be palpable and mute as a globed fruit, dumb as old medallions to the thumb, Silent as the sleeve-worn stone Of casement ledges where the moss has grown. A poem should be wordless as the flight of birds. A poem should be motionless in time as the moon climbs, Leaving as the moon releases twig by twig the night entangled trees, Leaving as the moon behind the winter leaves, Memory by memory the mind. A poem should be motionless in time as the moon climbs. A poem should be equal to not true, for all the history of grief, an empty doorway and a maple leaf. For love, the leaning grasses and two lights above the sea. A poem should not mean, but be. And this is something I want to emphasize to you. I'm sure through your educational journey, and you'll encounter this again, people have time and again wanted you to define what the poem means, explain what the poem means, but really that doesn't matter. This poem doesn't mean anything. It's called Ars Poetica, which means the art of poetry, but its meaning doesn't matter. There's, there's not a message in this except for the idea that a poem should not mean something. It should be. It should simply exist. It should reverberate in our consciousness. We should feel the need almost like a magnet, we should be drawn back to it to constantly contemplate it and find different meaning in it. And the language is what does that. Poetry is the art of language using sound and syntax to create emotional responses. So it's many things, but here's what it is not. It is not the sole province of the academic or the poet. You may have thought that ahead of time, that poetry was only for poets, but hopefully you saw through this lecture that it's not. It's not a riddle. It's not something you have to figure out what it means. It's not an essay. A poem never has a thesis. And it's also more than these ideas of butterflies in nature. There's a lot of nature poetry. It's really amazing. Uh, and there's a lot of really bad nature poetry, too, that gives poetry a bad name. We try to transcend that. So I have a few examples of some of my favorite poems. And I'll, they all are great examples of sound and syntax. And I want to share those with you through videos in, uh, in this lecture and also through my own reading. Uh, some of them I'm going to read to you. Some of them have video links. So this first one is Reeves Sign Language. And we're going to search for it on YouTube here. It was done on uh, Deaf Poetry Jam, a series that ran on HBO for some time. So let us... Actually, I am going to, before you watch these, I am going to take my video out of here again so as not to distract you. And so you can focus on this uh, recording here. I worked sometimes at a high school for deaf kids. We put on poetry readings and poetry slams. We call them deaf poetry jams. <laughs> One poet's poem goes, the night we met, so many moons were shining down on us so brightly, I thought, hey, maybe those moons have mistaken us for their gods. Another poet's poem goes, I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my. Doesn't anybody tell a story anymore? And another poet's poem goes, Last night I dreamt I was little again, and I could hear back then, but the silence in my house was deafening. See, some of the kids only write about being deaf. Others make a joke, some make a mention, some ignore the topic altogether. Not too different from the choices poets make here with gender or skin color. So you get goofy haiku like, Homework? is bullshit. 
and inspires out of me nothing but vomit. <laughs> and poems like, I saw on the TV that scientists have taught a gorilla to speak sign language outstanding. Why don't they teach the gorilla how to wipe its ass, assholes? <laughs> And the words, the signs themselves are as wonderful for me to watch as if they were hummingbirds or butterflies. Words like goosebumps, daydream, giraffe, sticky, icky, icky. <laughs> These are high school students who never pass notes in class. They just sign their shit behind your back. <laughs> and they greet each other in the hallways lately going, Can you hear me now? <laughs> no, that's good. That's fine. And they pester me for the lyrics to hip hop songs, which they prefer because they can feel the music throbbing through the speakers of the stereo we use for speech therapy. And I tell them, well, that says everybody put your hands in the air. And they do every month at our little poetry slams, where the audience never spreads out, it spreads back so that everyone can hear those hands. And it's damn near silent, and there is never a microphone. But sometimes the poets do rock their poems, and when a deaf poet rocks a poem, it echoes off the walls for these ears alone, like, Don't pay the note upon, I'm a note, don't know, I find it none, that, but then, no more. I was born as deaf and as quiet as a starfish. But if I had been born a man, I would pray to the Lord above every night at the top of my fucking lungs just to thank him for giving me voice. <laughs> One of the great poems to me, even though it appears and doesn't appear in a single anthology, and there's the text there, and of course this slideshow will be available for you uh, in the same way that my lecture notes were available for you for, uh, you know, what is literature. This is The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconeer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming... Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi trembles my sight. A waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body in the head of man. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it wind shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Careful What You Ask For by Jack McCarthy is another great, uh, again, I'm not sure if the link will work, so we're going to look it up. And we'll use the uh, snap judgment version because it's a pretty well, good recording. This is just getting started. We just had the youngest person ever on the snap stage. And now, now, we're about to go to the original gangster. Mr. Jack McCarthy is a legend in the performance storytelling circles. I cannot wait for you to hear him. I'm going to get out of the way. Mr. Jack McCarthy. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Glenn. Um, I don't mind being called original, but gangster might be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> I was just old enough to be out on the sidewalk by myself, and every day I would come home crying, beaten up by the same 
little girl. I was Jackie, the firstborn, the apple of every eye. Gratuitously bewildered me, and as soon as she'd hit me, I bawled like a baby. I knew that boys were not supposed to cry, but they weren't supposed to hit girls either. And I was shocked when my father said, hit her back. I thought it was a great idea. But the only thing I remember about that girl today is the look that came over her face after I did hit her back. She didn't cry. Instead, her eyes got narrow, and I thought, Jackie, you just made a terrible mistake. And she really beat the crap out of me. It was years before I trusted my father's advice again. I eventually learned to fight enough to protect myself from girls. But the real issue was the crying, and that hasn't gone away. Oh, I don't cry anymore, I don't sob, I don't make noise. I just have hair-triggered tear ducts, and always at all the wrong things. Tom Baudet saying, we'll leave the light on for you. I always cried at the last scene of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. In movies, I despise the easy manipulation that never even bothers to engage my feelings. It just comes straight from my eyes, but there's not a damn thing I can do about it, and I hate myself for it. The surreptitious nose blow for the street four minutes after the offending scene. My daughters are onto me, my wife. They all know exactly when to give me that quick sidelong glance. What must they think of me? In real life, I don't cry anymore when things hurt. Never a tear at 17 when my mother died, my father. I never cried through my first marriage. But today, I often cry when things turn out well. An unexpected act of simple human decency. New evidence against all odds of how much someone loves me. I think all this is why I never wanted a son. I always supposed my son would be like me, and that when he'd cry, it would bring back every indelible humiliation of my own life. And in some word or gesture, I'd betray what I was feeling, and he'd mistake and think I was ashamed of him. He'd carry that the rest of his life. I know. Daughters, daughters are easy. You can pick them up, you can hug them, you can say, there, there. It's all right. Everything is going to be all right. And for that moment, you really believe that you can make enough of it right. Enough. The unskilled labor of love. And if you cry a little with them for all the inevitable gratuitous meannesses of life, that crying is not to be ashamed of. It. But for years, my great fear was the moment I might have to deal with the crying son. But I don't have one. We came close once between Megan and Kathleen. The doctors told us there was something wrong. And when John went into labor, they said the baby would be born dead. But he wasn't. Very briefly, before he died, I heard him cry. It's uh, it's tough to hear that one without tearing up. 
This is by a good friend and mentor, Amy Flory. Ab abulation. Because one must be naked to get clean, my dad shrugs out of his pajama shirt, steps from his boxers and into the tub as I brace him, whose long illness has made him shed modesty too. Seated on the plastic bench, he holds the soap like a cotton fish in his lap, waiting for me to test the water's heat on my wrist before turning the nozzle toward his pale skin. He leans over to be doused, then hands me the soap so I might scrub his shoulders and neck, suds sluicing from spine to buttock cleft. Like a child, he wants a washcloth to cover his eyes while I lather a palm full of pearlescent shampoo into his, his cranitonomy scarred scalp and then rinse clear whatever soft hair is left. Our voices echo in the spray and steam of this room where once, long ago, he knelt at the tub's edge to pour cups of bath water over my head. He reminds me to wash behind his ears, and when he judges himself to be clean, I turn off the tap. He grips the safety bar, steadies himself, and stands. Turning to me, his body is dripping and frail and pink, and although I am nearly forty, he has this one last thing to teach me. I hold open the towel to receive him. Another friend, Jim Coppock, orbits decay. And so when I say we are each other's moons, I have gravity in mind and velocity, two forces in constant opposition, a body in motion, almost uncontrollable, hurtling madly into space is curved by another body and another motion hurtling madly into another space divining its own path based only on gravity, velocity, love, and the laws of physics. Another friend, the gentle knot, J. Bruce Fuller. When Jim fell off the roof, she heard a thud and looked through the shades and saw the ladder gently rocking. She thought she just he'd just gone up and failed to see his hand grasping the bottom rung knocking, knocking, calling for help that would not come. Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold, then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking, and when the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? <laughs> and finally, uh, speaking of Saul Williams, Rumi, and Hafiz, this is Rumi, translated by the poet Robert Bly, uh, and it appears in the Rag and Bone Shop of the Heart anthology, uh, edited by Robert Bly and others. That journeys are good. If a fir tree had a foot or two like a turtle or a wing, do you think it would just wait for the saw to enter? You know the sun journeys all night under the earth. If it didn't, how could it throw up its light in the east? And salt water climbs with such marvelous swiftness to the sky. If it didn't, how would the cabbages be fed with the rain? Have you thought of Joseph lately? Didn't he leave his father in tears, going? Didn't he then learn how to understand dreams and give away grain? Didn't Mohammed set out on a journey to Medina and found dominion there and became Shah of a hundred lands? And you, if you have no feet to leave your country, go into yourself, become a ruby mine, open to the gifts of the sun. You could travel from your outer man into your inner man. By a journey of that sort, earth becomes a place where you find gold. So give up bitterness and your acidity and your heavy heartedness. Don't you realize how many fruits have already escaped out of sourness into sweetness? And a good source of sweetness is a teacher. Mine is named Shams. You know, every fruit grows more handsome in the light of the sun. That's just a small sampling. There are literally millions of poems out there. Millions of publishers. Millions of ways to enter into poetry and to understand what poetry is. But I don't want you to think of poetry as necessarily 
something that needs to be unpacked and discovered uh, and understood in the same way that you understand a puzzle or a scientific equation, a mathematical equation. Poetry is much more complex than that, such as language. So as you continue thinking about poetry and reading poetry and understanding poetry, uh, try to understand the language, but don't necessarily unpack the language. Uh, experience it and then ask yourself, why is it affecting me this way? And here is our work cited. And what you should do now is participate in the discussions on D2L. Uh, begin thinking about a poem from the assigned readings you would like to explicate. The next slideshow will give you information on specific skills that you need to explicate, including recognizing formal qualities such as scansion, rhythm, rhyme, all those things, uh, and images. The only two poems that are banned from the reading for this explication are designed by Robert Frost, which is a fantastic poem, but I use it as an example, and Abby Houston Evans's Wing Spread. Uh, these are both used as examples in the uh, section in the textbook on writing about poetry, which you should also read. Uh, that begins on page, forgive me, uh, that begins on page 18. 16, 1816. And they also talk in that section, 1816, in your textbook on how to write an explication about a poem and how to cite poetry using MLA. And once you've participated in the discussion and I've had a chance to answer some of your questions and your peers' questions, you can move on to that next lecture that gives you specific skills on explicating. Uh, and then if you're interested, you can check out some of my poems here. They're linked here. Uh, these are older publications, and that is...